Okay, in this video I'd like to continue on with my tutorial series on complex analysis. This is video number 6 and I'm going to discuss the Cauchy Integral Theorem. As usual I'd like to draw your attention to my website universityphysicstutorials.com. Here have all my videos archived and listed and I have a few other bits and pieces which may be of interest to you. I'd like to remind you of the previous videos which are relevant. We are discussing complex analysis and therefore the videos on complex numbers are important. In the series on complex analysis I discussed the cauchy riemann equations, Green's theorem, the divergence theorem and the relationship between Green's theorem and the divergence theorem. Unfortunately the five videos previous to this in the series on complex analysis don't actually prepare us in order to discuss the Cauchy theorem and the Cauchy formula and therefore they don't allow us to get to the real meat of the series on complex analysis. Therefore I present a derivation of the necessary background in complex analysis in order for you the viewer to discuss the real meat. And the meat I define is the Lorentz series, the residue theorem and the evaluation of the Planck integral. The evaluation of the Planck integral is in actual fact the purpose of the series on complex analysis. So we are presently discussing the Cauchy Integral Theorem, so let's begin the necessary background in order for us to derive the theorem. Our first port of call are complex line integrals. When we move from the real axis to the complex plane, we denote all points as z. This is the complex number z and it's x the real component plus i times y the imaginary component. For example, if I said z is twice cosine t plus twice i sine t, I would say that 2 cosine t is the x component or the real component and twice sine t is the imaginary component or the y component. Ignore for the moment that I'm using t, I'll explain that. Unfortunately, not all equations can be written very easily or very usefully as let's say a function y a function of x or x a function of uh, y in two dimensions. For example, let's take the probably the most simple equation you'll see in your studies, the equation of a circle, r squared is x squared plus y squared. Now in order for us to even plot this, we need to rewrite this in four different manners or four different ways, here, 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 and here. And that's, it. that's not very useful, in actual fact it's quite problematic. And it motivates us to introduce something else called a parameter. So it's useful to parameterize a curve using the parameterization variable. And we introduce a new variable, a third variable, from x and y, and we call it t. And therefore, instead of writing z as a function of x and y, we write z as a function of t, x as a function of t, and y as a function of t. t, of course, is a real parameter as opposed to an imaginary parameter. Now, doing this, rewriting z, x, and y in, in terms of the parameterization variable t is actually not particularly easy. It's known as parameterizing your curve. Of course, mathematicians have analyzed the most useful or most common curves, and you can look those up in the book. So it's very easy, for example, to get the parameterization of a circle or an ellipse or whatever. But if you were to be presented with an arbitrary curve, it would be quite a tedious task for you to usefully parameterize your curve. So to deal with difficult functions, we introduce the parametric equation where we write x and y in terms of a third variable t. This is the parameterization variable. So we write x as a function of t, y as a function of t, and z which is a function of x and y now also becomes a function of t. This will give us the parametric curve. The parametric equation will give us the parametric curve. For example, let's say we wrote x as t squared plus t, y is twice t minus 1, where t went between minus 1 and 1. 
you'd get the curve here in pink. It would be quite a challenge for us to represent this just in terms of x and y. Now something I don't want to dwell on, but a parametric curve has a direction. It goes from low, low t to high t. In other words, it goes in the direction of increasing t. So in this case, it would be that would be the direction of positive. Now I'd like to move on to the topic of line integrals, complex line integrals. And I'm going to derive the equation for the line integral. Now, line integrals are something which I would imagine you've come across in your studies in the past. For example, if you want to calculate the work done by a force, you would perform the line integral along a particular path. Line integrals are sometimes referred to as path integrals or contour integrals. So let's consider a smooth curve and I'm going to call the curve C. And this is in the complex plane. And separate to that, let's consider a continuous function. I'm going to call the function f of z. Now let's say that the function f of z is continuous and defined at every point on the curve C. So we have all points along the curve C, but at each point along C, f is also defined. So in order to discuss the line integral or derive the line integral, we need to break up the curve C in the following manner. So we have our complex plane here where we have our real axis and we have our imaginary axis. The curve C is in pink going from what you can see here Z0 right the way up to capital Z. Now I'm going to parameterize the curve using T. So I'm going to say, let's say for example, the curve goes from x is equal to a to x is equal to b. I'm going to parameterize it with t, saying that t sub 0 or t0 corresponds to a, t sub n corresponds to b. And for every t sub n, we have a corresponding z. z is the value of our function. Excuse me, z is the point, excuse me, along c. So for every value along the x-axis parameterized by t, we have a point on the curve which we parameterize with z. So we break up our curve into a series of points, z0, z1, zm-1, zm, and so on. And each of those is actual fact, in actual fact gotten by looking at the points t sub 0, t sub 1, and the whole way up on the x-axis. Of course, if we were to look at the separation between two points on the curve C, let's take for example z sub m minus 1 and z sub m, we would get the magnitude of delta z sub m. So that deals or takes care of the curve C, but what it does not take care of is the continuous function z, or excuse me, f of z, which is defined at every one of the points. So it's defined, let's say, at z sub 0 and z sub 1 and so on. But the point z sub 0, z sub 1 and so on aren't really good for us. We need to look at, we need to use a, another dummy variable in order to analyze the behavior of our function f of z on the curve. So I introduce a second set of points, which of course are coincident with the points z0, z1 and so on. And I give them, I call them p. So, in, so z corresponds to points on the curve P corresponds to the, uh, the points where the force field is defined. And of course, in this particular case, the force field and the curve coincide. And of course, I give it a subscript. So this is the, the point P sub M. This might be the point P sub M minus one. I'm just making a distinction between the points in the curve, which I'm gonna call, give the placeholder Z, and the points for the force, which I'm going to give the placeholder p. Now, if we want to calculate the value of our function at a particular point, we have to calculate f of p sub m. That's the value of our function at the point p sub m. Of course, we are able to parameterize our function using t if we like. Now, 
Let's place our p sub m between z sub m minus 1 and z sub m, which is equivalent to placing it between t sub m minus 1 and t sub m. This means that the point p2, where the function f of z is defined, is between the points z1 and z2 on the curve, or t1 and t2 on the x-axis or p sub m where the function f of z is defined is along or excuse me is between the point z sub m minus 1 on the curve and z sub m. The next thing we do is we consider the sum. We consider the sum s sub n which is the sum of the product of f of p sub m which is the value of the function f of z at the point p sub m. And we evaluate that along the interval delta z sub m. So what we're doing is we're saying that the function is defined at this particular point p sub m. So we get the value of the function at that particular point which is this and we multiply it by delta z to calculate the total value of our function along that segment of the curve. In order to calculate the total then of course we sum along the whole curve, going from m is equal to 1 to m is equal to n. This of course is exactly what happens with the Riemann sum. Now if we allow n to go to infinity, so we don't change the length of our curve but we increase the number of points, well the curve becomes a series of points and they're all separated, of course they're separated by t sub m minus 1 excuse me, t sub m plus 1 minus t sub m, or t sub m and t sub m minus 1. But in the limit, this of course goes to 0. The separation in the points goes to 0, as of course we add an infinite number of points. This means that delta z sub m will also go to 0. So as the point z sub m and z sub m minus 1 get closer and closer, closer together, delta z sub m is going to go to 0. This means that our sum, s sub n, becomes a sequence of complex numbers. And this is what our line integral is. So we go from a discrete sum to a continuous integral. To write that explicitly, we have our sum here, and in the limit it becomes our line integral. So we say we have our integral, we say along the curve c of f of z dz. Where the start and end point on C coincide, we have our closed line integral here, which we donate by having a closed circle given onto the integral sign, and we give the direction along which we integrate by what I've written here is a purple arrow. That is a closed line integral, or a closed contour integral, or a closed path integral. I hope that wasn't too difficult. In fact, I'd be surprised if... Uh, if it's anything new to you. Before we continue, I'd just like to do a small bit of uh, revision. We are performing the line integral of our function f of z, the complex function f of z, along a curve in the complex plane C. Of course, if the start and end points of C match or coincide, we're talking about the closed line integral. Now, let's say we have our function f of z, and I'm going to call it w just for, just for clarity. So w is our function f of z, but it's a complex function, and every complex function can be written as the sum of a real component, let's call it u, and an imaginary component, let's call it v. But it's a function of z, and z is a function of x, the real component, and y, the imaginary component. Putting this together, it allows us to rewrite w, which is our complex function, as u plus i times v, where u is a function of x and y, and so is v. So we have our function f of z, which up until now we've only we've just left it at that. We now make the substitution that it's a real component u plus an imaginary component v each of which depends on x and y. And what we do is we plug this into our sum s sub n, which we have seen already. 
Delta Z, of course, is nothing else other than delta X sub M plus I times delta Y sub M. If we put that into our expression S sub N, we can rearrange for the real and the imaginary components separately. This I have done here. So there are real components, and here are our imaginary components. Now since F, U and V are all continuous, as N approaches infinity, or we get more and more points on the closed curve, let's say, C, the greatest delta X sub M and delta Y sub M will approach zero, and we will get the real line integral. This is written on the bottom of your screen. What I've done is I've rearranged so that we have the real integrals and the imaginary integrals separate. The line integrals exist, and it is independent of choice of subdivisions or intermediate P sub M. So let's revise. We are integrating our force or our function f of z. It's a complex function, and we're integrating it along a curve c. c is, of course, another complex function. I'm going to call it z of t like this. And z of t can be parameterized using the variable or parameter t as x of t plus i times the i times y of t. A moment ago we saw that if we separated out the real and imaginary components of our force function f of z, we could rewrite it having the real components and the imaginary components separately. Of course, we could easily parameterize these as well. So we could have u, which is a function of x and t, each a function, excuse me, x and y, each a function of t, if we like. So what we do is we see an alternate representation of this, this line integral. So the line integral written in its simplest form is the line integral of f of z dz is u plus iv integrated dx dy. So I've written that at the top right of your screen. Now just note something for a moment. Of course, if we take the derivative of z, our curve, if we take the derivative of this, it's simply going to be x prime of t and plus i times y prime of t. But x and y are both functions of t. So x prime is going to be del x of t del t plus and uh, y prime is going to be del y of t del t. Now, just let's consider another integral. Let's consider if we did the following integral here. So we're going to take our function f of z, which we're going to parameterize with t, and we're going to multiply that by z prime of t, which is our curve, by the way, and we're going to integrate that t, t, dt. It's important to note the distinctions. f of z is our force fun is our function. It's our let's say our force field, but z prime of t is the derivative of our parameterized curve along which we're integrating the uh, the force field. And what we're going to do is we're going to parameterize the uh, we're going to parameterize the force function with t as well. So here is our force function, which at the, for the moment I haven't le haven't parameterized. I've just left it as u plus i times v. Of course, it can easily be parameterized. And then we have the derivative of the parameterized curve. So it's x prime plus i times y prime integrated dt. So if you just multiply this out here, we get the expression written on the bottom right of your screen. Note, of course, is separated out the real components, u dx minus v dy, and the imaginary components, u dy plus v dx. But the point is, this is exactly what we started with. This is exactly the limit of s sub n as we let n go to infinity, or this is our line integral. It means that our line integral, which we had here, is equivalent to this particular integral here. How is that any, how is that any good to you? How is that useful to you? Well, let's tell you. First of all, you parameterize your curve z with t. Then you calculate the derivative of your curve z with respect to t and we get z prime. Then you substitute your curve z of t for all f of z. And then you perform the integral. The point to note here is that this function at, at the top right of your screen, f of z of t, this is our force, we'll say. This is what we'll usually be integrating. 
but we're going to plug in the parameterized curve in here for z. So let's say, for example, let's say our force was the following. In actual fact, I'm going to do an example in a moment anyway, so just bear with me. So let's take this closed contour integral. So it's dz over z, where the contour is along the unit circle counterclockwise. So I probably should have a little arrow like this to say which direction we are integrating. So the function, the function we are integrating is in actual fact 1 over z. That's why we're integrating dz. And we're integrating it along the unit circle. So we need to parameterize the unit circle. We parameterize the unit circle by saying it's cosine t plus i times the sine of t. That is, the parameter, that is a parameterized circle centered at the origin. We take the derivative of that with respect to t. Then what we do is we take our parameterized z of t and plug it into our original function anywhere we had z. So in this case it's 1 over z, so we get this, this component here, cos 1 over cos t plus i times sine t. And we multiply it by the we multiply it by the derivative of z and we integrate dt. The answer of course is twice pi i. In a future video, I'm going to derive what's known as the differential arc length formula, which is really what I used above. Some authors use it to rewrite the integral formula in the following way. And it allows us then to have three representations of our line or contour integral. I'm going to leave that there for a moment. You can pause the video to view that if you like. There are a few more things which I'd like to discuss. And we will need all of these later on. The first one is the absolute value of a complex integral. It's known as the ML inequality. Excuse me, the ML equality. <laughs> Pardon me. The ML inequality. It says that if you take the magnitude of your contour integral, it's simply going to be equal to m multiplied by l, where m is a constant such that the magnitude of your function is less, less than or equal to m along the curve, and l is simply the length of your curve. It's something I'm going to use later on, so we'll put it into practice then. Just remember the ml inequality for the absolute value of a complex integral. The next thing I'd like to discuss are the types of curves we can have. We can have a simple curve where it doesn't cross over itself, and we can have curves which are not simple, where they cross. We can have simply connected ones, where there are, essentially, there is only one curve. A doubly connected will have two curves, and a triply connected will have three curves, like this. We have one, two, three, like this. This will be a triply connected curve. This is not something I want to get bogged down in, but nonetheless, I'm putting it there for completeness. Now let's move on to the Cauchy Integral Theorem. I'm going to write it there for you first of all. So it says if we take the counterclockwise, and this is very important, it's a counterclockwise closed contour integral of our complex function f of z, it's equal to zero. Now this only works under the following conditions. When the function f of z is analytic, which is also known as holomorphic, if it's simply connected, it is a simple closed path c, and where its derivative is continuous. That, of course, is why I discussed the uh, the curves at the, the last minute or so. The next thing we need to discuss is what does analytic or holomorphic mean? This means that your function has a power series representation at the point x is equal to x0 in powers of x minus x0. It's something we will get very used to in the coming videos. Analytic is a synonym for holomorphic. Holomorphic in actual fact is the more modern term for analytic. So basically where your function has a power series representation, it's analytic or holomorphic, if you take a closed contour integral around any point, you will get zero. This, of course, does not work where your function is not analytic. In other words, where you have singularities or poles in your function. And that's something which the Cauchy Integral Formula and the Lorentz series will deal with. 
I'd like to prove the Cauchy integral formula, excuse me, the Cauchy integral theorem. Let's assume that our function f of z is in actual fact analytic in the domain d. I've written the three ways we can write our complex contour integral there in front of you. And I've highlighted in pink the particular ones we're going to use, the two, the, 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 the uh, variety or variant we're going to use. As we've said in the past, u and v should also have continuous partial derivatives because f of z is analytic and f prime is continuous. This allows us to invoke Green's theorem. You can see a previous video for the derivation of Green's theorem. Now note by the way I've of course used different variables but that's something which shouldn't pose a problem. So now I've written Green's theorem on top and our function on the bottom just so we can compare them. And we're going to use this particular expression of Green's theorem here. If you look or excuse me, if you look carefully, you'll see that our p in Green's theorem is plus u and our q in Green's theorem is minus v. This is allow this allows us to express our closed contour integral in the following manner on the bottom right of your screen. Note the negative sign, that's very important. Now at the moment, for the moment I've just addressed the uh, the real component. I'll address the complex component, or the, excuse me, the imaginary component in a moment. So putting it together, we invoke Green's theorem and we say that the closed contour integral of u dx minus v dy is the surface integral of minus del v del x minus del u del y del x del y. That simply is the real component of our closed contour integral. Next we invoke the cauchy riemann conditions for a path independent complex derivative. So they say that del u del x is minus del v del y but the important one here is that del v del x is minus del u del y. If I plug those into our expression up here, let's see what happens. If you look carefully, what we get in fact is that the, in the real component of our integral is zero. This is what we're expecting. We're hoping that the closed contour integral of an analytic function will give us zero. Thus far we've seen the real component is zero and let's do a similar thing and get the imaginary component. Now if you were to go back and have a look you'll see that for the imaginary component p in Green's theorem corresponds to v and q in Green's theorem corresponds to u. So we had we have our we have our equation here. We invoke the Cauchy-Riemann conditions and we see that the imaginary component is also zero. I don't really want to dwell on this. It's something which is pretty straightforward. And this allows us to define the Cauchy integral theorem for analytic functions or functions which have no poles, whereby we take a closed contour integral in an anti-clockwise fashion of our function, let's say f of z dz, it's going to give us zero. This is the Cauchy integral theorem. Before we finish, I would, it would be remiss of me if I didn't discuss uh, analytic functions and singularities and poles. So an analytic function has a power series representation at the point x is equal to x0, and it's in powers of x minus x0. Furthermore, it's differentiable at all points in the domain D, and it's differentiable at every point. Pardon me, if it's differentiable at a particular point, let's say x is equal to x0, we say it's, it's analytic at x is equal to x0. But if it's differentiable at all points, then we just say it's analytic. So the function, just because a function is uh, analytic at a particular um, point, doesn't mean it's analytic at every point. So there is a, a small but subtle distinction between these two here. So your function may be analytic at a, a particular point, but sometimes it's not analytic at all points. The last thing I'd like to int introduce is the concept of singularities and poles, which of course lead to infinity. Where an analytic function ceases to be analytic, at a point, we refer to the point as, as a singularity. 
a function is said to be singular at the point z is equal to z0, where the function f of z is not analytic or it is not differentiable or doesn't have a power series representation, it may not even be defined at the point z is equal to z0. But it's analytic if in the neighborhood of z is equal to z0, uh, or the neighborhood of z is equal to z0, there are points where f of z is in fact analytic. So just to say that again, the function is singular at z is equal to z0, where it might not be analytic or whatever, but in the neighborhood of z is equal to z0, the function is analytic. The singularity of, of f at z is equal to z0 is referred to, referred to as a pole. An index or power given the uh, variable m refers to the order of the pole. And we'll see later on that m is equal to 1 refers to a simple pole. I'll give you an example in a moment. Let's take the function f of z here, where it's 14 divided by z minus 4 to be squared and z minus 2 and z. Now we note that basically if z is equal to positive 4 or z is equal to 2 or z is equal to 0, this function blows up and goes to infinity. So we refer to these points as singularities or poles. Remember that at let's say z is equal to 4, so the function blows up at z is equal to 4, but at let's say z is equal to 3.9 the function is defined. So in the region of the pole at z is equal to 4, the function is analytic, and therefore the point z is equal to 4 is a singularity. Now, if you note here, there is a power of 1 here at z minus 2, so the pole at z is equal to plus 2 is of order 1. The pole at z is equal to plus 4 is of order 2. This is important for later on. The pole at z is equal, z is equal to uh, 0 is of order 1 as well. If f of z is analytic and has a pole at z is equal to z0, then the magnitude of f of z goes to infinity as z goes to z0. Remember, analytic functions have power series representations at a particular point. They are differentiable at all points in the domain. But some functions aren't differentiable or analytic at every point, and we say that they are they might only be differentiable or analytic at certain points. Where a function ceases to be analytic, we refer to that as a singularity. And generally, we only really say it's a singularity where in the region or the neighborhood of the singularity, the function is in actual fact analytic. So it's, it, might, it is just ceasing to be analytic at a very small point, a particular point in space, and is generally analytic in the neighborhood around that. So I leave you with, at the bottom of your screen, the Cauchy Integral Theorem. This is for analytic functions, functions which have no poles. They are essentially infinitely differentiable, and they don't blow up as your function approaches a particular point. So thanks for watching. Please pass it on to your friends. Subscribe to my channel, and you might also give a visit to universityphysicstutorials.com. Thank you.